Hello, everybody. This is Brian for Breaking Down Security. This week is part two of our interview with Lee Holmes. Uh, we're going to get right into the discussion this week with Mr. Betcher asking the question that sparks our, our philosophical debate for the first, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, where we talk about whether or not, um, you know, the creation of PowerShell is a good thing or a bad thing. And, uh, you know, by, by di- you know, by extension, other tools that are out there say the PowerShell empires of the world and, um, you know, was it ethical to create them in the first place? So the first question you're going to hear is Mr. Besher asking him about uh, the lowest day that he's had. Have a great week. Yep. Yeah, we presented at Black Hat. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, so... In your talk, you you mentioned the your lowest point, April 9th, twenty fourteen. Uh, can you speak to that? What happened and how you got over that and maybe made things a lot better? Yeah, you know, um, it's just so frequent that when you know when you take a look at people who are in traffic and getting angry with each other, it's because there's a bit of humanity that gets separated from that amount of isolation being in your own cars like you'll see somebody cut somebody off in traffic that you know they would never cut somebody off in a physical line right like there's just it's just too in your face we're in a world where where the computer kind of back and forth has done the like taken that up another notch and so you hear about ransomware getting out there and yeah like you know, somebody got ransomed and it's just all words. It's just talk, talk, talk. But sometimes you really run into these exper- experiences where you realize that there's an actual human behind something. And uh, so April 9th was this time where this new worm, the posh coder ransomware was coming out. And uh, this was something where this was the first time I had seen somebody writing kind of the actual business logic of, of an attack in PowerShell itself. Uh, up until that point, it was mostly just stagers, but somebody had felt like, hey, I can do this proof of concept in PowerShell itself. And so, uh, yeah, they wrote the actual crypto you know, via .NET in PowerShell. And just reading through these like pages and pages of people being impacted by this ransomware and and coming together and trying to figure it out and just getting to the point where like at some point somebody's like i've got my my life of photos here and i can't afford this ransom i can't get the back this is this is my life and it, it's one of those situations that just hits you where you just just the amount of humanity just dripping from that blog post is just it's just burned in your head forever and, you know, I felt a lot of, you know, like a lot of sadness about that. You know, I, I did feel a lot of like, oh, man, if we never did PowerShell, this specific person probably would have never lost their photos. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But it was one of those things where it hits you and you start having those doubts. It, it's interesting as you kind of sat back and, and thought about it and felt this guilt of, something you did being like 100% of the reason why somebody's lost all their family photos. And at, at some point, you know, I also have had to realize that you know, something we did was 100% behind some people, you know, recovering their companies from ransomware and, and other things like that. So, um, you know, it just it really emphasized at that point that was happening at about the same time that we were really starting to invest in the the whole security transparency stuff in PowerShell. And, you know, the, the security transparency stuff hadn't come out yet, but it really helped kind of uh, reinforce that it was the right call that we were making. And I think it's, it's had a pretty big impact since then. And seeing, you know, Python now uh, already having the ability to do security transparency in the engine itself 
And anybody using Python 3.8 or beyond, all they have to write is this little shim that will convert a regular Python.exe into a version that's, you know, ratting out whatever attackers are doing is just amazing to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, when when there are certain tools that are, you know, brought out at, at conferences and such, PowerShell Empire was one of those. It was like, why make it and why release it? Because my first thought as a defender is, how are the bad guys going to use this? And I see that a lot of things. It's like, oh, yeah, great. They, they've created this project or they've created this thing and it's really cool and it does the thing. And I'm like, how are bad guys going to use that? And uh, a do- lot of times I think they just don't think about that or they just miss one of the use cases that it might, might be used for. Right? I'm like, I think PowerShell Empire, they kind of had an idea. Um, of course, I, they they just stopped developing on that one recently. But uh, in in favor of all the other clones and things that have come out that are far better, uh, is what I understand. But you know, there's just some tools out there. It's like there's only one reason it's going to be used, and that's not for good. So but, you know, I gotta uh, counter that. And you 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 might think that I would be the wrong person to counter the use the release of offensive tools, but. You know, Jeffrey Snover, when we uh, presented at DerbyCon uh, in 2016, uh, he had this phrase, which was, there is there is true security, which is, you know, will an attacker who's using a command and control framework be able to attack you or not? That's true security. Do you have the logging in place? Do you have the right training in place? Do you have the ability to react to one of these things when they're actually happening? Answering those things, that's true security. Then there is uh, the, the phrasing of there is hope fueled by ignorance, right? <laughs> Where uh, if you think that the thing that's going to make you more secure is by saying that Empire never was written, that doesn't really address any of those core, core things that you need to do for true security. And so if it's not Empire, it's going to be one of the 45 other Python-based C2 frameworks. Uh, a C2 framework in the InfoSec industry is like hello world of, of programming. It's This is a thing that I'm passionate about. This is a thing that I need to deal with all the time. I can figure out how to make a agent talk to a controller and hello world, right? So these things pop up all the time. I don't think that even though it became popular, I don't think that Empire significantly changed the capabilities of attackers. I've seen signatures in uh, next generation AV and EDR tools that are specific to Empire. Mm -hmm. You change one letter, and they won't detect it, right? Do they make those same signatures for these other C and, uh, command and control um, things like Empire um, that people don't know about that are that are used by real attackers, not just red teams? I don't think so. They don't. They never grow to the level of infamy that some of these things do. You know, you'll find. Almost every antivirus has signatures for Metasploit and Empire, but um, you know, like Faction, the new thing that that Jared Haight and IBM X Force are working on, um, if most things don't have signatures for that yet. And uh, and so by blocking Empire, you're not really solving your problem. Hmm. Well, you know the 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 same man. Uh, the same argument could be done for PowerShell. If you had not created PowerShell, yeah, exactly. they'd use exactly. WMI or they'd use, you know, the stuff left over from like Windows XP days. I know we've talked about WMI quite a bit on the show in, in the past and Mr. Betcher and them were telling us, you know, it's, it's super powerful without having, you know, PowerShell in place. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if, if they didn't use the tools that were, you know, the new hotness, then they were going to be using whatever's been there for a while or even legacy stuff. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still seeing and hearing about uh, OLE type uh, 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 malware that's, uh, you know, taking advantage of those kinds of uh, technology in, in email. So, yeah. It, but, you know, now if you're using PowerShell, um, we're going to catch you. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's that we've learned how to detect these specific things 
um, and upgrade PowerShell and use the logs that it gives us. So we're just, we're just like, Hey, if you use PowerShell, that was so two years ago. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I am, um, really optimistic about in the, in the security space is when we were addressing these attacks on things that were leveraging PowerShell, we really thought about some of these, these core things leading into them as deep in windows as we could. So for example, when malware was going off and fetching new code dynamically at runtime, you know, from the internet, deobfuscating it and then running it, we realized that what we needed there was the ability for the engine to be able to call like just interactively into antivirus and say, I know that you said the file that I loaded was okay, but is this still safe to run? And that we we worked a lot, and that's called the anti-malware scan interface now in Windows. It's a it's a interface that any antivirus vendor can plug into. Defender was the first, just because we worked with them as well. Uh, teams uh, like companies since Windows 10 was released have been able to write extensions, and it's honestly kind of shocking to me how like a bunch have, but also a bunch haven't. Um, and so I think the the approach that we went through with security transparency, when you take a look at, like this is literally a new thing in the security space. Uh, there's nothing, you know, when PowerShell made it into Linux, open source PowerShell, that was the first shell in Linux ever to support security transparency. Like Unix and Linux and whatever have been rocking it for all these years, but it wasn't until open source PowerShell made it there that you had a shell in Linux that could tell you what it was doing as it was doing it. And, you know, I think we're in a great place with Python now starting to uh, opt into this security transparency stuff. I'm, I'm really excited about the future there. And, and I think as we start to realize that there's a different way to think about dynamic runtimes than there used to be when it came to just regular XEs and DLLs loading, that you start to have some of these patterns that were laid out by PowerShell and Python that truthfully apply to a lot of other things. So AMSI is not just for um, EDR vendors. You can have any application plug into it, right? It's just an API? Yeah, so AMSI is, is two sides to it. So one side is the application that wants to protect itself. And so there's a Windows API that you can say, scan this buffer or scan this string. And so this is where, for example, you might have PowerShell asking to evaluate some content before running it. You also have other things, for example, in Windows, when you get the UAC elevation dialog, it calls into AMSI because sometimes those elevations are in really sketchy contexts and you want to let Defender block it. You also have, like you can imagine any like instant messenger clients being able to say, I just got this link from uh, in the content. Is this a link that's safe to run? So there's the client side. And then the uh, kind of like the, the AV agent side of things is similar to the way that Windows lets you plug in other antivirus vendors. So you can, you know, plug in McAfee or plug in something else and they're going to get uh, you know the the position of showing in the Windows UI of whether it's been disabled and all that kind of stuff. Ah, I got you. So they also have the ability to plug into the the other side of this API that so that way when a vendor is in there and they're listening to this stream, they're getting PowerShell is going to be asking them every time it runs dynamic content, whether it's still safe to run. And so it's just this incredible stream of insights that I, frankly, I'm surprised that more vendors aren't just jumping on it. They used to have to do this kind of stuff with really fragile API hooking on APIs that change all the time. And, uh, you know, API hooking into .NET code is never fun. Right. 
Um, let me see. We, we had some show notes down here. I also added a link to AMSI just in case people didn't get a- anti-malware scan interface. Uh, so found- you're... You're also an O'Reilly author, right? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. We're so, <laughs> O'Reilly siblings. Right. Um, uh, so your book is the Windows PowerShell cookbook. Uh, so any thoughts about writing a uh, all-defensive PowerShell book? Oh, man. <clears throat> if I would have known how much time went into writing a book, I would have... <laughs> <laughs> jumped off a cliff the first time somebody mentioned it yep mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and you wrote all of yours i at least got to share share half of mine <laughs> and what made it worse too was um the cookbook was all about hey this isn't built into the project it's not baked into the project but here's a little script that can make your life better and so when i wrote it for version one of powershell there was a lot of things that were like so clear and obvious that they should be in the product that we did. We just put them into version two. And so it wasn't just like writing new content for the, th- the second edition and the third edition. It was packing out like 40% <laughs> of what was in there for the first version and then writing new stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The amount of work I tracked it all to the hour and it was, did you, just, yeah. I should have. I was interested because I was, I thought initially, you know, I, I had been blogging about PowerShell, you know, since the beginning and I thought this will be pretty good. I'll just, you know, take some blog posts, change the language a little bit. Right. <laughs> but <clears throat> it's never the way, like even the one, the one that I thought was going to be the easiest move was talking about the add type commandlet in PowerShell where it's, um, showing how to take some of the resource that exists out there. The add type command let, lets you invoke into native Windows APIs. And so there is a lot of documentation out there about how to do it from C Sharp using the P invoke syntax in C Sharp. And so it, it's this blog post that I put up that was a very literal walkthrough of, hey, look on something on pinvoke.net, put it into this format. And, and I thought it was going to be like just slide it in right as the as the answer f- as a recipe but once you start getting it into a certain editorial style and you know problem solution discussion uh, mm-hmm. it's all over yeah it, it was oh, yeah. so much work <laughs> <laughs> so wait you had a specific format for writing the book because i didn't i didn't get that in ms berlin's book i was just, no i'm just kidding oh, oh yeah. Yeah. You're like, what? Shots fired. Shots fired. was oh. it even edited yeah oh my gosh oh. editing is so painful oh. Uh, O'Reilly yeah, has you know, their own format, and also getting out of the word uh, world of thinking that it's a judgment. Mm. Um, truthfully, most of the magic of writing happens happens during editing. Um, I took a professional writing major in in university, and um, so we did scientific writing and stuff. And you know, the, always the philosophy was just write out roughly what you want to say, and then kind of fix it in post. Uh, as you're going to be doing here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Uh, so, you know, I, I just saw the other day that Bill Pollack at No Starch was looking for, you know, who would you like to see write a book for No Starch? And when you mentioned, you know, when Miss Berlin mentioned the defensive Derby Con, uh, d- uh, defensive PowerShell book, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe you should reach out to Bill and do a No Starch book or something. But, I- yeah. Yeah, to do another book, I mean, I'd have to drop three other projects that I'm working yeah. on. Too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's understandable. Somebody out there wants to do a PowerShell defense project. So, and uh, you know, like people have this misunderstanding that being an author like entitles you to money somehow. <laughs> and like, obviously, it's made some money, but like for for a technical book to make money worth impacting your life is exceedingly rare. And at this point it's like, are you, <clears throat> uh, the main reason I did the cookbook was wanting to make sure that there was good content out there for PowerShell version one that helped give examples of what a good written script looks like, um, that gave recommendations that were like truthfully in the direction that we felt were like good recommendations uh, because when a, a V1 project comes out, it's pretty common 
for a bunch of books to come out that are just trying to be out there for V1. And you end up getting a really bunch of low co- quality content. And we just, we were actually really fortunate that a bunch of the, most of the PowerShell books are really driven by people who have passion and do a good job. But it was more about making sure we had just some good quality kind of horse's mouth stuff out there. Awesome. Awesome. So, so before we go, uh, I, I would be remiss for my blue team friends and colleagues and work people. If we didn't have maybe some, some quick wins on what to do for PowerShell, if you know, they're deployed, you know, if it's deployed in the environment, I mean, the, the new detection is not still like, well, if a user is using PowerShell because you're using PowerShell to, you know, manage the box, but, um, is that still a is that still a valid uh, detection mechanism? It's like oh, Bob in accounting is using PowerShell. It's probably probably not him using that. So it's probably something nefarious. I mean, should it, anybody can answer the question here? But I'm just thinking, you know, is that still a, a valid indicator of, of, of compromise potentially? Like LogMD has done some good work at um, kind of capturing a bunch of the quick wins in terms of the approach of like just looking for things that are out of normal, looking for execution by policy bypass, looking for some of these things, looking for strange uh, <clears throat> process lineage. Um, there's also the um, um, uh, deep blue CLI that, that I think, I'm not trying to remember who was presenting about it at previous <laughs> Derby cons, but it's also like kind of pre-canned regexes that can really help out. There's a lot of benefit to just trying. Um, you do get some issues to deal with about whitelisting and stuff, but also as a quick win, like, like literally just enabling script lock logging, enabling transcription, get it going to a share because even if you don't feel like you've got the skills to write defensive stuff, it's an incredible flight data recorder. If you run into an issue, having those logs at your at your disposal of being able to go back in time and understand what happened. If you have to, if you're like, I don't understand what I'm doing, but if I have to call in somebody for incident response, they're going to thank me for having this and it's going to save you you know, $100,000 of remediation costs, like that's still a quick win. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Uh, Eric Conrad, uh, D- uh, DerbyCon 2016, talking about Deep Blue CLI. So there's a link in the show notes to that as well. Um, I'm on it tonight, man. I'm just finding all yeah, this good stuff, man. So, Lee, can you talk about why this decision was made to allow mistakes uh, for people who are writing script and um, PowerShell kind of making up for that, like a misspelling of a command? And it just says, well, I know you meant that you wanted this command and go into uh, constrained language mode. <clears throat> so there are some interesting experiments out there in the community of, of helping you figure out when you might have made a typo on a command name, for example, like you do like get child items and it'll recommend, did you mean get child item? Um, there's never been one of those built into the project itself, but I think there's been some, uh, we've always known that it would be something that would be pretty fun to write up. And there's been some really good experiments about that uh, online. So if if that's a thing that interests you, that'd be super cool to look up. <clears throat> there's a couple of fun implementations out there. Is that what you were talking about or? Not necessarily. I, w- I was talking about where I can write a PowerShell command um, like execution policy bypass mm-hmm. and I can spell it EX PLBY and, and somehow oh, yeah. it, it works, right? And so that um, if, if you're not doing security that well and you're just looking for signatures, mm-hmm. well, you look for execution policy bypass, you may not find it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, some of the... Um, as a shell language, a lot of the short form concepts also stem from the the same world that you have in Unix and Linux of when somebody is good at the shell, they should also be efficient at the shell. And so you have a lot of things that are 
<clears throat> like in any Linux command line, you're going to have the dash dash, super dash, long dash, version dash, of dash, you know, all that kind of stuff. Or they're going to have two or three shortenings of that same parameter. And so PowerShell does the same thing. You can have the long parameter name, or also you can have the minimum form of the parameter name that disambiguates it from others. And so that is one thing where kind of knowing the tools of your environment helps, knowing that PowerShell supports that and writing the signatures down to the point where it actually traps on the the minimum disambiguated version, I think is the is the right thing to do. So kind of understanding how people can abbreviate and obfuscate. And this is one of the things that I think <clears throat> Daniel Bahannon's invoke obfuscation framework did a really good job at is saying what you've been writing signatures for are basically the the super most basic IOCs that show up in these blog posts. But here's a bunch of stuff that the language supports. And often there is an equivalent in Bash or Perl or Python or whatever. But just being aware of what these are helps you write robust signatures. Yeah. Um, his tool was the ultimate counterexample to a signature-based uh, you know, method of catching bad things, right? Yep. Was- and one of the things that I think has been really interesting is <clears throat> he's uh, – so. The first I saw this was in the Deep Blue CLI presentation by Eric Conrad, where what he did as part of that presentation was, and a toolkit was also released some uh, EVTX files, like the actual captured event logs, so that you could run the get win event commandlet to actually import them and then test your signatures against uh, captured malware. So he had event logs that had captured. I don't know, like a wanna cry outbreak or something like that. And it included some stuff that was ev- uh, evading, trying to evade signatures and whatever. And you could use that as a test bench and start to write SIGs and see what stuff that you're capturing, what, what you're not. Um, Daniel Bahannon has been doing some presentations recently about uh, DevSec defense that kind of takes that even further by. Um, having a corpus of like really well-known obfuscated stuff and letting you run your detections using the pester unit testing framework and like writing a, a detection and literally seeing a bunch of like reds and greens as the unit tests pass or not as these evasions are bypassing your signatures. And so I think it's just a really, really smart way to just as you're writing a defense, really think through the, possible variants of it and work to make sure that they're capturing those as well. That's cool. And I wonder if he allows uploads to real attacks as well from the log events. There'd be something that, you know, we could all contribute to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I thought it'd be, there's been a couple kind of PCAP libraries out there of, you know, capturing here's what a network outbreak of something looks like. I yeah. think we haven't done the greatest job as a community of saying, here is what the system and security event logs look like on Windows when you get hit by, you know, wanna cry or something. Right. Now, unfortunately, you would have to um, implement something other than the default logging that Windows gives you. It's it's unfortunate that you don't get command line logging and and uh, and all that by default. Yeah, <clears throat> that was done for for privacy reasons. There was a big concern of today, and it's true that a lot of people in their default command line logs have passwords. So net use is an example, and, and other things. And so enabling that by default potentially opens you up to the danger of having these things in your event logs. And so that's why it's not done by default. The The risk of making that decision on behalf of a company who doesn't realize it's happening might put them at risk. Right. That's usually the pushback we get from, for, I mean, that that's pretty much the only pushback we get other than it, it'll hose my system. It'll, it'll just uh, increase the CPU and stuff like that. And then we, when we asked for, um, okay, do you have any data supporting that? They can't give us any data supporting yeah. that. So they fall back on, well, it might have passwords. 
um, things like that. Um, and constrained language mode. Can you uh, tell us the advantages and disadvantages of that and why we might want to implement that? Sure, yeah. So constrained language as a background is a version of the PowerShell language that eliminates a bunch of the techniques that attackers use uh, when they're basically trying to write a, a full-on Windows application in PowerShell. So they're doing a bunch of platform invoke calls into Win32 APIs, and they're calling into a bunch of like crazy .NET APIs to to do things. They're not using it as a straight shell. They're not using it for its language features like hash tables and loops and all that other stuff. They're really just using it as like a syntactic difference to writing inline C sharp. And so <clears throat> one of the things we did is as part of uh when we started going down this path of making sure that dynamic runtimes like PowerShell could be a stand-up citizen in a highly secure environment. So for example, the when uh, the Windows RT tablets were happening, it was like Windows 8.1, when Microsoft was investigating a platform that was more media and app focused. So you have a, a tablet, you run apps, it can run PowerShell, but you don't want to write apps in PowerShell. So more like kind of like the iPad kind of feel. We wanted to make sure that PowerShell in that mode, you're not using it to write just arbitrary apps. And so what we did is when you've got a system that is locked down and doesn't allow arbitrary DLLs and XEs, then PowerShell automatically moves itself down to this version of the language called constrained language. So the perspective being, if you've locked down your system, then PowerShell will automatically lock itself down further and block access to those kind of APIs. Uh, it'll still allow like the loops and variables and kind of like the basic stuff that you would get in just a regular shell, um, but block access to kind of advanced features of the language. I don't think that it's a... One of the things that we did is we explicitly tied it to when PowerShell recognizes that you've locked down the system. Uh, there was a big desire for people who said, well, let me just turn on constrained language mode for PowerShell so that the malware can't do its stuff, but not block XEs and not block DLLs. I think that's a really risky behavior. It, um, sure, it, it blocks PowerShell-based malware from being able to write Mimikatz, but ultimately an attacker who's doing that, well, they could just have done it with like literally Mimikatz or, or a right. XE or a DLL that they just recompiled themselves. So there have been some examples in the past out there of uh, enforcing PowerShell into constrained language by just setting some environment variables specifically. Uh, but I think it's a dangerous path to take. It's kind of the disabling PowerShell kind of approach. But we do have, um, in terms of like what it is about PowerShell and what does it block in constrained language mode or not, we've put out some good blog posts that talk about PowerShell constrained language. I'll find some of those. I actually found one that wasn't from Microsoft, which in hindsight is ignorant of me to not find one from Microsoft to put in there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll do my best to find one from Microsoft about PowerShell defense. So. It's PowerShell constrained language is the... It, um, it says com objects are blocked. <clears throat> they can expose Win32 APIs that have n likely never been rigorously hardened as part of an attack surface. Yep. Um, is that all com objects? I mean, I thought there's a vast array of com objects and most tools use them. Um, well, here's this is where things get really interesting. When you have a system that's locked down with application control, so device guard or, or something like that, you're worried about an attacker who's on the box and you don't want them dropping XEs or DLLs because that lets them do arbitrary things. You want to limit yeah. them to do only the things that are on the box already that you approve of. And so, so from that perspective, then you have to start worrying about, well, what if the attacker found a com object that 
never realized that the API that the com object is exposing might ever get a, you know, a username that's like a megabyte of A's. Like they've never thought about that as a straight up attack surface. They've always thought, well, somebody calling this com object from a script or whatever is going to feed it generally nice things. Right. And, you know, there's been some interesting research in the past about people just fuzzing command line command line utilities in Windows or Linux and just getting crashes all over the place because the authors of those tools had never thought what happens if somebody jams in an integer overflow into this like pointer to a window handle kind of stuff. So those are, that's the reason why we block all com objects by default because they've never thought about themselves as being attack surface. And the same reason why primarily we block uh, pretty much all of .NET because .NET has never had all of the random methods and whatever think of themselves as a primary attack surface. Hmm. Um, so as I was looking through here, uh, uh, one of the things that came up was uh, just enough administrator. Is that still applicable to, to be able to limit and, and reduce uh, uh, PowerShell usage in the environment only to you know certain commands or certain items, certain endpoints? Yeah, yeah. So PowerShell just enough administration is one of those exact things that I was talking about where there will be people who just quietly like magically solve world hunger and never talk about it. And and like the big problem that you have in both Windows and Linux are over permissioned administration where somebody becomes an administrator and because they got it, they got to go like do patches and they got to do stuff, but you don't necessarily want them to have full access to the machine that they're administrating. And so it like, I, I've, I've had situations where, so <clears throat> uh, just enough administration is a great way to say, you get to still use PowerShell, PowerShell remoting to talk to this machine, but rather than getting kind of an ad hoc arbitrary endpoint, you get given a list of fixed commands on what you can do and what you can't. So this is more like when you log into kind of one of those SSH endpoints of a, of a well-written sw switch that just gives you like a menu rather than an arbitrary shell. And so that's what just enough administration is all about. And it's uh, pretty magic. And speaking of people who just like amaze you from out of the blue. Uh, I was at a PowerShell summit at some point and somebody was like, I just wanted to thank you because <clears throat> we used to have some over permissioned administration of a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we implemented PowerShell just enough administration and now we no longer have arbitrary administrators with access to uh, a reactor. And I was like, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't Seaman Johnson need to be able to, you know, move those control rods in and out? You know, I'm just no. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so sorry. I, I, I what that? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you that there are still tools out there that allow for you know removal of of unnecessary permissions. Um, one of the other things that I found interesting on your blog was uh, you're also the person. So remember, Mr. Betcher, uh, you and I and Ms. Berlin, one of the first shows we did was on the hi hierarchy of security controls and how, you know, maturity of organizations go higher and higher. Guess who wrote the blog post for that? <laughs> he might be right over there. <laughs> he might be right over that there. might not be the same one. I, I think Maslow's hierarchy is just such a wonderful foundation of the way to talk about these things. Are you no longer involved in, in PowerShell development? Uh, you never lose involvement with something that, you know, shapes you and the, and the world so heavily. Um, <laughs> I'm not on the development team right now. I still very frequently talk with the team, you know, about security things as I hear a thing that they might be, or, you know, we'll brainstorm about a solution to a thing. Uh, you know, the, the team is, just rocking it with all the stuff about pinging, bringing PowerShell to Mac and Linux. And, and mm -hmm. that's having some really interesting mind shifts about 
what it means to bring a a new shell onto Linux. So, uh, yeah, they're doing a great job, and it's it's great uh, that they still care deeply about security. Is that the uh, the focus right now, or is there something else coming? <laughs> That's it, it's shocking how much work it takes to take a, a Windows administrative shell, even as as influenced as it was by Linux uh, and Unix and you know DE deck primitives, but it's shocking how much work it takes that to make it open source. Um, I think the team has been amazed at the the kind of the community governance. So much now of PowerShell, fifty percent of it is being written by the community, which is is incredible. Wow, fifty percent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bringing in amazing things. It's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Wow. All right. Uh, do if there are no other questions, uh, we are probably the longest podcast we've ever done to date uh, because there's just so much good information in here. We're definitely going to have to make this one at least a two parter. So, uh, Lee, I know you're a very prolific speaker. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate. Uh, I don't know what you had to do to tell your organ your employer that you wanted to come on a podcast, but it's been a nightmare to get anybody from your organization uh, as a whole. To, to come on to a show because there's always maybe maybe you took the hey here's how you list talk to media class i don't know but um i we appreciate you uh, greatly coming on the show uh to to do so uh will you be making any more speaking appearances this year uh probably i don't know offhand uh yeah it's you know i, I do think that we're uh fortunate to have a security community that is so good at sharing information and uh i i just love it being able to attend conferences and just absorb everything that everybody's got to bring to the table it's just amazing fantastic okay uh miss uh miss berlin uh is going to be joining us up here next year uh for infosec camp out i'm hoping right. it what's that i said all oh, right i'm like for what I'm like oh right it's going to be next year and I'm going to make yeah. sure that I send an invite to Mr. Holmes here so he can come and maybe do a, do a discussion with us, uh, maybe a PowerShell panel or a blue team panel that we could have you and him on, uh, perhaps. That would be awesome. Um, so, uh, Lee, if people wanted to discuss PowerShell and all of its glory and, and fun and you know maybe some more history lesson uh, stuff, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, I think, you know, the... the- community out there for PowerShell is amazing. Like if you pretty much ask a PowerShell question into the wind, uh, somebody is going to pick it up because the people are so good at, at on Twitter, for example, monitoring it. Uh, there's PowerShell.org has a pretty good set of forums. Um, and uh, yeah, so me personally, I'm on Twitter at Lee underscore Holmes. Um, nowadays, I'm not necessarily the smartest on PowerShell. Uh, there's just but the they can ask so you uh, Azure questions too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I just love how much sharing happens in this in this community. Awesome, fantastic. Okay, Miss um, Berlin, tell a little bit about Hackers Health and what you're doing there and how to get a hold of you. Uh, you know, outside of that. So. We don't have any more villages scheduled for this year. Oh, yes, we do. Megan's doing one at the Texas Cyber Summit. Which will be and on the I 10th. Don't. So this will come out after that. So hopefully she had a okay. good time. Right. Hopefully she did a great job. <laughs> she always does. Uh, and then we don't have anything until February, I think. But I am giving a keynote at GERCON uh, soon. Nice. And I just kind of finished that talk today. So I just need to practice it a whole bunch. Um. And I'm teaching in Secure WB in November, but that's that's not uh, mental health related. What are you going to be teaching? Uh, we are doing our uh, security D and D class. It's uh, defense and detection. Oh, all right. Uh, it is based around actual like D and D tabletop game stuff, and we have them 
attack machines and actively log on it and defend it and then all mix in like D D rules yeah be, be careful with your terms we don't want to get sued by wizards of the coast or anything so right they love themselves Are you gonna bring some d20s i hope yeah, so oh yeah. yeah well we we have special ones with uh a unicorn on the i think the i think the unicorn's on the 20 oh, cool. fantastic yeah all right. Very nice. So how would people get a hold of you to talk about Hacker's Health or, you know, just uh, your appearances in general? Uh, so at InfoSister on Twitter or at ha- Hacker's Health. Awesome. Uh, Lee mentioned LogMD, Mr. Betcher. Why don't you tell people what that does? Well, LogMD is the uh, malicious uh, log and discovery tool. And... Uh, I wrote it along with one Michael Goff to help you um, find malicious activity on your system or systems. And right now uh, we got a couple of things down the pipe. Um, we're still testing and implementing our static analysis tool. It's looking really good uh, and it's really fast. Um, so that'll be built into uh, the single binary that is LogMD. And then also we're, we're working on hunting features. So if you find a particular malware in your environment and it has this uh, one signature that you know, if you, any system in your environment has that registry key file in a particular location, uh, you'll be able to find it with LogMD. We, uh, we use wildcards and things like that to help you out. So yeah. Uh, a lot of cool things coming out. Very nice. And uh, if you want to find out more, log-md.com. Got to put the dash in there. Otherwise, you uh, if you just put logmd.com, you'll get some proctologists in Wisconsin. So don't, don't Which go there. Which you may also need. You could. You, you could. never know. Well, at and least... At least I it's like not the whitehouse.com, the, whitehouse.gov issue. So, you know. I like that you found my note in the in the show notes, Brian. I could I, tell when you found it. Yep, yep. I just make sure. So. He had put me last on the list you're of, never, all the infos, of, all the, of all the Twitter handles. You're so never last. Scott Pack. You're never what? last. <laughs> you're always the best. That's like we're saving the best for very last. But um, So uh, we have a very active Slack uh, the BreakSec community is uh, thriving on there. If you are interested in hooking up with like-minded InfoSec people to professionally hook up, sorry, professionally hook Thank up. Thank you. I was going to say something, but we're the not the Tinder of InfoSec. Don't try. Uh, we are on uh, on Slack. You can send us an invite to the official podcast Twitter handle at BreakSec, B R A K E S E C. Uh, you can also send us an email to bds.podcast at gmail.com and we'll allow you in. And we have a ton of channels. We have a CTF club. InfoSec Camp Out, we're still getting that ready and working on that. That's going to be next year, 28th and 29th of August, which I understand is uh, Burning Man is always the week before Labor Day, which is also when we're having the conference. So if you're not going to So Burning- this is going to be like an InfoSec version of Burning Man. <laughs> yes, without all the patchouli oil. Yes. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, that's right. I don't really like patchouli anyways. That's okay. We still have the weed, so you can still come and do the weed. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if you are interested in more about learning more about the conference that we're going to be having up here in the Pacific Northwest in August of next year, uh, follow us on Twitter, InfoSec Campout. I'm one of the organizers along with uh, Matt Domko and Wendy Knox Everett. And it's, uh, it's, we, we run it through a nonprofit. Uh, I also have a local <laughs> meetup called CSEC East. We meet the first Wednesday of every month. And uh, we go to, you know, different restaurants or we have speakers like last week, Miss Wendy uh, Knox Everett and Jen, uh, Jen uh, from uh, GitHub was talking about, you know, questionnaires, cake and cookies, the AIQ. So we went through some of the, the pitfalls of filling out vendor questionnaires. And, uh, and then we, we had a really great discussion with uh, Mr. Gray, Laren Gray on um, – uh, audit hooks in Python 3.8 and how those can be uh, abused or uh, are used to uh, find entry points into an engagement uh, or to, uh, to an application. And he'll be speaking at Texas Cyber Summit too. So by the time you've heard this, it's probably going to be far past that. But I hope that talk went well for him because he, he did the guinea pig uh, bit on us. So he didn't have demo videos and stuff. So he's still he was still working on that when we left. So, uh, okay. So, um, Thank you to all of our patrons. 
Uh, thank you for uh, you know supporting the podcast in the in 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 a monetary fashion, giving us a bit of a tip for uh, hosting, for paying for the the Zoom that we use, for the time and effort just put out the the show, and the amount of time it takes for us and all of our moderators to uh, maintain sanity on the uh, the Slack channel. Not that it's all that hard. People self police, but I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Scott Pack. Uh, Dave Cybuck, uh, Megan Roddy, who's also on uh, Hackers Health with Ms. Berlin, and um, uh, Annie, who we've had on the show previously for the social engineering bit uh, as, as our moderators. And uh, we do have moderators. We have a social contract on the Slack. So if you're interested, uh, join that. Uh, T Public Store, uh, if you want to get a t-shirt with Ms. Berlin's face on it, which she's, she's promised to update so that it's no longer you know her old face it's her face that she's done when she was it's on my keto. older face older face uh well it's older in that it was i mean you. that one i was like 10 years younger so maybe i should keep right. it you update the face yeah update the face that'd be good um but you can join us uh you can join us and buy a, a t-shirt for break sec and we get a little kickback on there as well um it's uh tpublic.com slash user slash bds podcast all one word so that was it for the week and probably for the week after that, because I, we're definitely gonna have to cut this into two sections. So Lee, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I hope that uh, you and I will get to meet and meet space at some point in the near future. Uh, since we, you know, live not even 20 miles from one another. I did not know that. So that's cool. Um, yeah. Thanks. This is really fun. Yeah. Roger that. All right. So uh, that was it for uh, breaking down security this week. Uh, have a great week. Please take care of yourselves and be nice to one another. Um, you know, you're the only you you have, so that's why, you know, your mental health, especially around the time of the year when we're, you know, getting towards holidays, it's important to, uh, you know, look out for yourself and look out for your friends because it can get a little sad around this time of year. So, um, you know, if you see somebody struggling, don't don't hesitate to reach out and say, you know, have a shoulder to, to talk to or cry on. So, um But yeah, just uh, be a friend for somebody. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. 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 Ciao.